The narrative begins as a young boy steps into the school premises, prompting a hushed murmur among the girls. A cluster of them notices his distinctive uniform and speculates whether it's from a neighboring school, pondering if he might be someone's boyfriend. Overwhelmed by the presence of numerous girls around him, he wants to go home. He wishes for someone to come to his rescue. Just then a voice pierces through the air, calling his name Daiki. As he turns to acknowledge the voice, his friend accidentally steps on his foot, prompting him to wince from the sudden throbbing pain. He tells Wakaba to constrain herself. She immediately apologizes to him and swiftly changing the subject, reminds him of their plan to go to the riverbed, proposing that the loser will treat the winner once again. She is confident in her win but Daiki, with grim determination, mutters about not losing today. They head there and engage in their usual soccer match. Wakaba appears as a strong opponent not letting him win the game. She screams in joy about getting another win, and she's already decided that Daiki will treat her on the way home. He wonders about Wakaba, she's his lifelong buddy. Her looks and appearance are tomboyish. She is a big troublemaker wrapped in a mischief package. She's like the embodiment of chaos and weirdness. And to Daiki, she's not just a girl. She's like his cheeky little brother that he never asked for. She is full of herself as her confidence could rival Mount Everest, and she struts around like she's the queen of the world. They go to a restaurant for the treat and after they leave, Wakaba proudly declares her satisfaction with a full stomach. Meanwhile, Daiki opens his wallet to check his balance. In a moment of truth, he realizes he's dangerously close to being broke for the month. He turns to look for Wakaba, and to his surprise, spots her standing outside a clothing store. She is gazing at clothes in deep contemplation. He playfully walks to her and inquires what's got her attention now. He asks if she is still hungry for more. Getting a little closer to her, he sneakily points out towards the shop, asking if she is checking out those clothes. Wakaba feels shy as he is standing too close to her. With a frustrated sigh, she screams that she got caught red-handed. Daiki scratches his head, pondering that clothes like these must be magnetic for a girl at this age. He tries to be encouraging and suggests that she try those clothes on, telling her she might rock that style. But Wakaba, in a rare moment of hesitation, shakes her head in a no. He continues saying in his jesting role that who knows if they might just even suit her, especially clothes like this. He tells Wakaba to have some confidence as it's not like her. After listening to his pep talk, she erupts, fuming why he thinks that she doesn't know. She has got a face that could launch a thousand ships. He is taken aback by her words. He silently wonders about her confidence level which is off the charts. She proudly retorts if he can handle this much sass of him. In a rare moment of self-reflection, she throws out a cheeky challenge to him that if once he sees her in these, he will start seeing her as a whole new girl. But he should know that she does not care about his views as always. As Daiki witnesses Wakaba's confidence reaching new heights, he internally muses that she's a reservoir of confidence. But on the outside, he shows a casual response that he also doesn't care either about her looks. Ignoring his words, she smoothly changes the subject to cut to the chase and offers to meet her up on Sunday, and she'll be wearing it. Daiki can't resist teasing her and asks if she is about to wear it right away. Wakaba with a grim expression redirects him that they are meeting at the usual statue. She tells him about her plans to watch the giant shark zombie movie. Sunday arrives, and our protagonist is sitting alone, eagerly waiting for Wakaba at their designated meeting spot. His mind, however, is a whirlwind of thoughts of her confidence levels that are off the charts. He can't help but wonder if she'll go all out and show up in some outrageous crazy getup. Just as he's lost in thought, she suddenly appears and teases him about his punctuality. His mesmerized gaze reveals his sudden realization of her femininity, Wakaba proudly announces. She wore it, leaving Daiki dumbfounded. Stumbling over his words, he tells her that she seems different from her usual self, and Wakaba, wearing her pride like a crown, tells him of course while pondering that it took her a good two hours to get ready. He looks stiff around her, and just like that, their plans for the movie slip away from their minds after the unexpected turn of events. Since that unforgettable day, Wakaba has remained her usual self. One morning, Daiki is seated at the breakfast table, mid-meal, when the doorbell suddenly rings. His concerned mother urges him to hurry up as he is going to be late for his school. He stands up and goes to the door. Peeking from the doorway, he sighs inwardly, noting Wakaba's familiar cheeky 
and tomboyish demeanor. Wakaba, in her typical style, cuts straight to the chase and asks him if they have to run to school at full speed again as they have already gotten late. Seeing Wakaba's urging to hurry up, Daiki finds himself slightly flustered by her presence, and in confusion he closes the door on her. He's struck by the realization of how adorable she looks. Wakaba is unimpressed by this and protests him to not close the door by loudly calling him a four-eyed. Daiki contemplates his previous successful escape in the morning. He recalls being caught off guard by her irritation. However, as he faces Wakaba's irritated expression, he scratches his head and attempts another excuse. He tells her that remembered something that he forgot. She ignores his protest telling him to snap out of it. On their way to school, he finds himself reflecting on Wakaba's earlier words. He ponders if her warning about being conscious of her as a girl was actually a cleverly laid trap, and if she's enjoying seeing him flustered like this. But it was him who suggested she try those clothes on, and if she wanted to tease him, she'd usually be doing it already. As they walk to school, he notices her unusual silence on the matter. It is contrary to her typical teasing nature. They reach the school's entrance, but she doesn't bring up the topic at all, leaving him both relieved and slightly confused by her unexpected change in behavior. Amid a classroom session, Daiki is sitting on his chair and absent-mindedly twirls his pen. He is still lost in thoughts and ponders if something significant happened at her school. He is confused about her suddenly becoming fashion-savvy or skilled at makeup. He wonders if she is all influenced by a new friend, perhaps. He considers this potential shift in Wakaba's style. His imagination runs wild as he considers the possibility that it wasn't a friend but perhaps a boy influencing her. Daiki chuckles to himself that it's about her who rocks a jersey, and she can't be bothered with anything else, and there's no way she'd change her style for some guy. Meanwhile, in her school, Wakaba is walking alone when she is approached by a trio of girls. One of them calls out to Wakaba, inviting her to sing karaoke that day, mentioning an invitation from Fujita Senpei and their group. Confused, Wakaba inquires about it. At that moment, she notices another group of friends waving from a distance. Instantly, she declines the offer, stating that she can't go with them today. Despite the girl's insistence, Wakaba remains firm in her refusal apologizing and telling them that she has some pressing matters to attend to. Maybe they can catch up next time. With that, she hurries off to the washroom and contemplates her situation in the mirror. She thinks that she could stick with this appearance. While putting on some lipstick, she muses that he was definitely acting a bit odd this morning. She thinks it'd be pointless if her look ends up scaring him off. She admires herself in the mirror and her eyes sparkle with self-assurance. She concludes that for now, she will just roll with this look. She nods in approval, praising herself with confidence that she looks perfect. In a playground, our cool Daiki is eagerly waiting for Wakaba's arrival. As she finally shows up, he impatiently tells her that she is late. She playfully says that she was just giving him some time to practice more. But it doesn't matter as she is gonna win again. Daiki, with a hint of frustration, grumbles that she is making him treat her with these matches every day, asking if she has nothing else to do. Just then the ball flies through the air. Anxiously, he reminds her not to kick it without giving a heads up. She chuckles and offers an apology. Her demeanor is tomboyish as she engages in these playful exchanges with her beloved. Daiki is sitting calmly at home, munching on snacks and flipping through a comic book. His mother interrupts him and asks him to check the home delivery box. He questions surprisingly why he's the one who is tasked with it. Maybe our boy Daiki is too lazy. His mother insists that he's not occupied at the moment and he should go. He lets out a sigh as he finds it a bother. Unwillingly, he gets up and heads towards the door, opening it with a clack. To his surprise, he finds Wakaba on his way down the building. She stops to see him and asks if he's heading somewhere. He explains that he's just picking up a delivery. In return, Wakaba mentions that she's off to the convenience store because she's been craving fried chicken while studying. Perplex, Daiki questions if she plans to eat at this hour as it is so late. Wakaba signals about her younger sister's wish, but the elevator doors open and she swiftly exits, indicating she'll catch up with him later. He also begins to walk along with her. Wakaba inquires about what's happening and why is he coming along. He responds that he's also craving some fried chicken because of her. Understanding his craving, Wakaba asserts that she won't be treating him to anything. 
Our annoyed hero mentions that despite always paying for her, she refuses to pay for him just for once. She playfully taunts him with laughter, suggesting that if he dislikes it, he should try to win against her, though she doubts he could. Her laughter aggravates him and it prompts him to mutter his frustration at her. She enters a food store and completes her purchase. After she makes the payment, the salesman thanks her for her purchase. She exits the shop and claims that she is sorry for making him wait, as she tried to be fast. Daiki mentions to her that he left his wallet at home. As always, it prompts an irritated response from her. She questions him with annoyance as to why he even came along with her. On their way back home, Daiki reflects on recent events and realizes that he's been feeling somewhat excited or nervous whenever he talks with Wakaba. However, today, their interaction felt normal much like usual. He wonders if it's because he can't see her face. As Daiki contemplates, he finds himself staring at Wakaba's face with his eyes wide open. She notices his gaze and wonders why he's staring like that today, considering how flustered he was just the other day. He shifts his gaze and pleads with her to have some mercy and give him just one chicken. Wakaba firmly responds that she already told him she is not giving him any. Later on, when they reach their building, she asks him to wait outside her house for a moment. Daiki is taken aback by her request, but he stands still. When the door opens again, he is taken aback to see Wakaba, whose entrance seems like a bomb as she is in her night pajamas. She shows him some ice bar saying that it is something out of pity for the idiot who left his wallet behind. She hands it to Daiki and teasingly calls it an escort gift and bids him good night. She closes the door with a clack. He remains in shock, his heart racing like a drumbeat. As he enters his house, his mom asks him about the delivery, but Daiki is still bewildered. In response to her question, he just shows his confused expression. Meanwhile, lying in her bed, Wakaba realizes that she totally forgot that she didn't have any makeup on. The next day after school, Wakaba's friends call out to her and suggest stopping for some fraps on their way to home. She politely declines their offer and mentions that she has other plans for the day. Hearing this, her friends become visibly disheartened. Wakaba apologizes sincerely and expresses regret for not being able to join them and promises that next time she'll not fail to make it. She bids them farewell with a promise to meet up next time. They are four close friends, Wakaba, Momo, Akko, and Shina. While sitting together in the absence of Wakaba, they notice her unusual behavior which triggers suspicion among them. They recall how Wakaba seldom hangs out with them after school. It prompts them to wonder about the reason behind her apology. Akko suggests the possibility of Wakaba working part-time, but Momo questions why she would hide it if that were the case. Akko, while eating something, speculates that maybe it's a job Wakaba wants to keep secret. Momo is taken aback and he suddenly suggests that it could be something like a job that involves receiving money and other items. She is visibly shocked by her own suggestion. While discussing Wakaba's mysterious behavior, Sheena adds to the conversation, suggesting the idea of Wakaba being involved with a sugar daddy or possibly serving as a money mule. She clarifies that a money mule is someone who transports cash obtained through fraudulent schemes, a thought she didn't initially consider when discussing Wakaba's situation. Akko confronts Momo, questioning why she is overly concerned about Wakaba's situation. She asks if Momo plans to spy on Wakaba. She emphasizes that Wakaba is their friend. Momo feels confused after hearing this and denies having such intentions. She just expressed her concern over Wakaba's silence despite their friendship. She feels saddened by the fact that Wakaba isn't sharing anything with them despite their supposed closeness as friends. Akko reassures Momo with a smile, suggesting that there might not be much to worry about and speculating that Wakaba's behavior might simply be due to having a boyfriend or something similar. She reasons that Wakaba might be cautious around them because they're all single. However, her expression changes to disappointment, feeling betrayed by the fact that Wakaba is potentially having a boyfriend without informing them. She suggests spying on Wakaba. Sheena agrees with Akko's sentiment and nods along with the idea of spying on Wakaba. It surprises Momo due to their sudden shift in attitude. As they begin their surveillance, Sheena identifies Wakaba as the target and prompts Akko to initiate tracking. Momo reflects on how invested they become in this endeavor. When Wakaba comes into view, Momo wonders aloud about her destination. Suddenly, someone calls out to Wakaba, catching her attention. 
Sheena notices her angry expression, suspecting that she's upset for some reason. Determined to continue tracking, Sheena suggests they follow her. Wakaba sighs while checking her phone and eventually enters a convenience store, where she browses through clothes. Sheena discreetly observes her from a corner, while Wakaba is sitting on a chair. After some time she is engrossed in a book, unaware of Momo keeping an eye on her. Akko is also discreetly watching her every move. Momo whispers, wondering if Wakaba is just casually relaxing as she appears entirely normal. Akko, with suspicion in her tone, mentions Wakaba's recent phone argument with her boyfriend. Sheena murmurs, mentioning that she entered a convenience store and then left, carrying various meat items, fried chicken on a stick, fried chicken wings and meat buns. Akko expresses her belief that Wakaba seems likely to binge after a disagreement with her boyfriend. Momo sadly contemplates that it would be more enjoyable to spend time with friends like them than have a boyfriend causing such reactions. Akko suggests calling out to Wakaba. She expresses concern about her eating all that alone. Momo agrees, suggesting they make it seem accidental. Suddenly, Wakaba starts running, prompting Shina to scream and alert the others that she's fleeing. Akko urges them to pursue her, and after a brief chase, they're left panting and out of breath. Momo comments on Wakaba's speed, remarking that she's too fast. Akko, also catching her breath, echoes Momo's sentiment about her speed. They consider searching for her, but Akko is exhausted and feeling tired and frustrated. She expresses a desire for something cold to drink lamenting their situation and feeling like they're back at the beginning. Sweating and catching their breath, Momo agrees to drink fraps, to which Sheena nods in agreement. Momo reflects on their failed attempt to uncover anything about Wakaba's situation. Meanwhile, at a distance she angrily shouts at Daiki for being late. He responds, explaining his delay due to prior commitments. He tells her that he is feeling too hungry to play soccer that day. She hands him the food and explains that she already knew about his response, so she bought the items as a sort of pick-me-up after his remedial classes. She playfully mentions that she thought she could be the one treating him for once, and suggests they eat together. He is surprised and adjusts his glasses. He expresses disbelief that she's treating him. Upon seeing his reaction, Wakaba questions him irritatingly, asking if he doesn't want the food. She suggests that she'll eat it all herself since she's a little hungry after running here. Daiki quickly responds, expressing his willingness to eat it. She invites him to sit beside her on a bench, patting the spot. Excitedly, he notices that it's all meat, confirming if he likes meat to which he replies affirmatively. Through the choice of food and her actions, Wakaba is expressing her feelings towards Daiki. Her gesture of offering him meat Knowing that it's something he enjoys is her way of showing care and consideration for him. Wakaba's childhood friend Daiki doesn't get along well with girls, as she has known him since childhood. In a nostalgic moment, she recalls old times about herself and Daiki. She reminisces about a time when she called him to go bug catching. That is why she made herself more like a typical guy. She was just five years old back then. She vividly recalls another incident when she was nine years old. They were sitting in their class when they heard a girl screaming because there was a bug on her, and without hesitation, Wakaba swiftly snatched the bug off the girl's shirt, calming her down. The girl thanked Wakaba for saving her. She then showed the bug to the other girls and she only received fearful responses as they urged her to throw it away. She tells Daiki about how everyone made a big deal out of a small bug incident. He responds, suggesting that girls probably struggle more with bugs. Wakaba laughs but playfully questions why he's making it seem like she isn't a girl just because she's comfortable dealing with bugs. He playfully teases her, suggesting that she's pretty much like a guy. Wakaba is surprised by his comment. He mutters in response, saying that's exactly the Wakaba who's easy for him to talk to. We see them in another setting. When Wakaba is 13 years old, as they walk together she suddenly points towards a couple and jokingly remarks about their closeness, shouting get a room. Lovebirds, Daiki warns her to stop. He is concerned that the couple might overhear her comment. Despite being young, she exudes a confident and outspoken demeanor, unafraid to voice her playful remarks in public. As they're walking, they overhear the girl suggesting going to a super cute cafe together next time. Meanwhile, Wakaba suggests to Daiki that they should head to the arcade. She expresses determination to finally clear the shooting game this time around. 
While in the arcade playing the game, Wakaba reflects on the idea of cute restaurants and after-school dates, acknowledging her interests but prioritizing fun together over typical relationship dynamics. She decides that being tomboyish is fine. Now at 15 years old, we witness Daiki, visibly angry, expressing frustration over a guy who has been incessantly bragging since getting a girlfriend. He feels that the dude needs to quiet down. Wakaba laughs and dismisses the guy's behavior as merely reveling in the feeling. She shows her nonchalant attitude toward the situation. Daiki sighs, possibly feeling resigned and exasperated by the situation. He loudly expresses his desire for a girlfriend, prompting a surprise reaction from Wakaba as she has been hiding her feelings all this time. She reminds him that he mentioned that he is not good with girls. He admits it is a different issue. He clarifies that seeing others in relationships somehow makes him want a girlfriend as well, despite his earlier admission of struggling with interactions with girls. Wakaba appears frustrated and annoyed at Daiki's wish. She secretly refers to him as a four-eyed asshole. She wonders why he hadn't expressed his feelings earlier. After school, she is at her home contemplating her plans for their upcoming movie night. She muses about making him develop feelings for her eventually. Meanwhile, Daiki is alone in his room. He sneezes and sniffs, pondering if he might be coming down with a fever. As he contemplates, he reflects on the movie choice Wakaba wants to watch, The Undead Shark. He's unimpressed with the idea, even finding the trailers unappealing, forming the opinion that it seems like a low-quality movie. In the present, on their way back to the house after school, finally the four friends are enjoying fraps together and gossiping. Each one of them expresses their appreciation for the drink. Akko praises how great fraps are, Momo compliments the delicious blend, and Sheena mentions how much she can drink. However, ten minutes later, Akko seems to have a change of heart. Feeling a bit cold and expressing her dislike for the slushy residue at the bottom of her drink, Wakaba, noticing the shift in Akko's energy, questions where all her enthusiasm from minutes ago has disappeared. In response, she questions Wakaba about her rare appearance with the group. She replies with a smile, saying she doesn't think it's that uncommon, but acknowledges being occupied earlier. In her thoughts, she recollects about Daiki informing her that he had to take a retest today and wasn't sure when it would finish, suggesting she should go home without him. Wakaba expresses frustration to him questioning if he didn't just literally review it. At present, Akko comments on how Momo gets a bit grumpy when Wakaba doesn't join them. Surprised by this revelation, Wakaba responds, expressing surprise and finding her reaction cute. Momo, feeling frustrated, denies being grumpy. Akko then reveals that they had a suspicion about Wakaba having a boyfriend, and they even followed her once, which was quite challenging. Surprised by this revelation, Wakaba asks if they really followed her. Akko exclaims affirmatively, asserting their suspicions about Wakaba having a boyfriend, and questions why she didn't tell them if she had one. She tries to divert the conversation and questions if they can talk about the stalking incident first. Akko shouts and defends their actions, stating that they were convinced Wakaba flaked on them to go on a date with her supposed boyfriend. It prompted them to stalk her. However, Akko admits they got tired halfway and decided to go home. She demands Wakaba to just confess how the date went. She expresses frustration that Wakaba doesn't seem even slightly guilty about the situation. She is relieved after thinking that it seems like her friends haven't discovered something about her. She addresses the situation, telling them that she doesn't have a boyfriend. She clarifies that the incident they witnessed was just her hurrying to meet up with her childhood friend. Akko reacts with surprise, realizing Wakaba has a childhood friend that she's never mentioned. She responds casually, mentioning that most people probably have a childhood friend. Shina wonders if this childhood friend is a guy to which Wakaba confirms that he is indeed. Excitedly, her friends ask more questions, inquiring whether he's attractive or if he resembles someone famous. Their curiosity and enthusiasm show their readiness to learn more about Wakaba's mysterious childhood friend. She tries to downplay the nature of her relationship with her childhood friend and describes him as just a regular friend asserting that she's never seen him in a romantic light. Akko, seemingly disappointed, questions if he's not cool. Wakaba clarifies, mentioning that she didn't say he isn't cool. When Nako asks eagerly about his appearance, Wakaba hesitates, describing him as really nice and someone who always helps her by carrying her stuff. Wakaba launches into an unstoppable monologue about her childhood friend, describing his height, 
his school, and even the peculiar mismatch of his glasses. She mentions his caring nature towards his sister while being a bit careless himself. As she goes on, Akko interrupts, marveling at the sudden flood of information. Wakaba now suspiciously questions Akko's sudden interest in her friend's details. She teasingly persistent, tries to coax Wakaba into rating her childhood friend's attractiveness if he were at their school. Wakaba responds, puzzled by the idea of rating her childhood friend, asserting that he's simply a childhood buddy. But then, she humorously adds that, from an odd perspective, maybe he'd rank around fifth. Akko reacts dramatically, expressing envy and a desire for a cool boyfriend too. Wakaba clarifies to her, emphasizing that he's just a childhood friend, not someone she's romantically involved with, objectively describing him. Wakaba's perspective is a little distorted. As they walk further, Akko jumps into a discussion about wanting a fluffy bitch and something dog. But Wakaba shuts down the idea and claims that she would tire of it instantly and advises her to get a boyfriend instead. Both Wakaba and Sheena bid farewell and head their separate ways. Akko sighs in relief, announcing it's time to head home. Momo queries her about taking the bus. They end up walking towards home while Daiki walks out of the school after finishing his work and trudges his way home. He is still feeling the exhaustion from that retest. Akko and Momo observe a tall guy walking in front of them. They slyly whisper to each other, speculating if the tall guy with glasses is from Numahai. As described by Wakaba, her friend also studies in Numahai. They wonder if it might be the one they saw. The next day, Akko excitedly approaches Wakaba sharing the coincidence of spotting her childhood friend. With enthusiastic flair, she exclaims, showing her a picture. Isn't that him? That's what they were thinking. A tall, glasses-wearing hottie from Numa Boys High. It's gotta be him. Wakaba is shocked and upset, expressing her surprise and frustration. She mentions that they cannot take secret pictures of someone. Then she suddenly screams seeing the pic and remarks, wait, who the? The next morning, Daiki walks to school and one of his friend with his head down lets out a sigh, he inquires about the reason for Matson's such behavior. Another friend informs Daiki that he has been like this since morning. Matson clarifies that life is now a tragedy since his girlfriend broke up with him the other day. After hearing this, Daiki and his other friend seems happy and opens a bag of chips because it's time to celebrate. Matson becomes angry and tells them not to celebrate with a party. Daiki said, what a shame, since Matson was bragging like crazy. Then his other friend states, It looks like she didn't renew her subscription after the two free trials. Now that is just a straight-up violation. Matson starts getting mad and tells them to introduce him to some new girls. As there is nothing better for a broken heart than a fresh pursuit, Daiki's friend, who looks like he hadn't slept in weeks since he was finishing up his dating sim games, he introduces him to Lily from the realm of virtual girls. She is not only a fantastic singer but the sharp quips. However, Matson prefers real girls over pixels and wants someone he can touch. Daiki tells him that no one who goes to an all-boys school is going to be able to help him. Matson asked Daiki about his female childhood friend that he talked about. Matson asks him to introduce him to her. Daiki gulps and recalls an incident from two weeks ago when he told his friends about his friend whom he has known since they were kids, but she is more like one of the bros. He begs Daiki to introduce her to him. Daiki starts sweating and explains to him that she's a crazy tomboy. However, his friend doesn't care about any of that at this time, even if she is a gorilla or praying mantis. He wouldn't bat an eye. He doesn't mind starting as a friend. The guy is desperately begging to meet her. Daiki got home and he's out on his balcony thinking about his decision. He doubts that Wakaba would have any interest in him. She'll just start treating him like he's one of the guys so he thinks that it should be fine for them to meet. He wonders what he should do when suddenly Wakaba pokes him and scares him. He asks what she's doing here, so she explains that she heard the door open so she popped out to see what's up. Daiki lets her know it's nothing important, and as he's about to tell her that one of his friends wants to meet her, he stops himself and realizes that if his friend were to get along well with Wakaba, she'll end up replacing him with his friend, and it'll be over for him. So he saves himself by telling her that his friend wants him to set him up with one of her friends from school. Wakaba gets confused after hearing this, so Daiki explains that his friend has recently broken up, and he is in a slump. He tells her that his friend also said he'd be cool if they were to start out as friends. Wakaba smirks and asks if it's fine if it's her instead. 
Daiki gets shocked and she says if it's just friends then there's nothing wrong with it being her right. Daiki starts sweating and he tries to come up with an excuse as to why it can't be her. He lets her know that she has to play soccer with him so that means her after school time is already booked. Wakaba is stunned to hear this and she lets out a sigh of relief. Then she bursts out laughing over the fact that Daiki <laughs> is excited to be her practice dummy as he hasn't beaten her once. She claps his cheeks left and right. He ponders he just knows she has got a shot eating grin on her face right now. Then she smiles and started blushing. He asks her if she has any friends who would be down for hanging out with him. Wakaba starts thinking about her friends who would be interested in finding a boyfriend. There's not a lot of options, so she thinks that Akko would be the best choice since she was talking about gals who are nice to Otakus and stuff. She once even invited her to find a few otaku around. She asks if it matters what happens to his friend after they meet. Daiki lets her know it's completely fine because his friend would even date a gorilla. Wakaba lets him know she'll ask her friend about it and says goodnight to him. A few days later, Daiki asks Metsun how it was to hang out with his childhood friend's friend. Suddenly he grabs their hands and lets them know that after going out, he realized that friendship is the greatest relationship and he is no longer looking for a girlfriend. Daiki tons in to a show that claims today's lucky spot belongs to the Leos. They'll discover what they've been searching for. As for the last spot, it's for the Cancers. The show warns them to watch out for trouble from the opposite sex. Daiki chuckles at the thought that he has gym class bright and early today. He glances at the clock and is shocked to see it's already 7.25. He can't stop thinking about Wakaba, who still hasn't shown up. He starts to wonder if she accidentally fell back asleep. He decides to give her a call, but she seems a bit out of it. He starts to worry if she caught a cold. However, Wakaba reveals that she's actually staying home today, leaving him surprised. On his way back home from school, he can't help but ponder how someone as lively as her can possibly get sick. He's a bit worried about her and wonders if getting her something refreshing might help. Maybe a can of yogurt would do the trick. He steps into a store and starts browsing. Suddenly, he spots something that she's absolutely crazy about. With a smile on his face, he reaches out and grabs her all-time favorite peach jelly from the shelf. After paying for it, he happily walks out of the store, knowing that he's made the perfect choice. As he strolls along, he ponders whether to hand it over to her before heading home. The big question, is she awake? If not, he could always sneak it into the fridge. When he reaches his building, the elevator doors open right on spot. Talk about perfect timing. He signals to the girl inside to hold the door and hops in before it closes. Next to the girl, our clueless boy is feeling a tad awkward. He sees the elevator button lit up and starts questioning if he accidentally pressed it. To his surprise, they're both getting off on the same floor. He can't help but wonder if there's another girl like her on his floor. He never paid attention to anyone else besides Wakaba, of course. As the elevator doors open on the seventh floor, Daiki is shocked to see the girl stepping out. The girl does a bow and gracefully exits through the door. Meanwhile, our hero ponders that it might look super sketchy if he also leaves right now after she just bowed to him and already left. So he decides to play it cool and wait for her to go into her room first. As the Momo strolls down the corridor, she's all confused wondering if it is room 704 or 705 in which Wakaba lives. She is frustrated thinking why didn't she pay attention when she called her at school. She looks around, sighs. She spins around, her mind racing with thoughts of what to do next thinking if she should give her a call. But before she can even process her options, she's taken aback to find Daiki standing right in front of her with a silly expression on his face. The sight leaves them both completely speechless, like two fish out of water. Daiki, with a donkey-like grin on his face, starts blabbering away, desperately trying to explain himself. He insists that she's got it all wrong, thinking she had already gone inside and he wasn't intentionally following her. He just didn't want to seem creepy by getting off at the same floor. His ridiculous explanation continues as he adds that he should have just hopped off the elevator if he knew this awkward encounter was going to happen. She finally snaps out of her surprise, shoots him an annoyed look and demands to know what he wants. Inside her house, Wakaba is starting to think that Momo has fallen into a black hole or something because she's taking so long. She's beginning to wonder if Momo has forgotten which room she's in. She thinks if she should have waited out in the hallway for her. She cracks open the door and takes a peek outside. 
she can hear voices chattering away. Looking around, she spots a clueless dude insisting that he actually lives on this floor, not the one below. And guess who this clueless guy is? None other than Daiki with Momo by his side. Wakaba is utterly baffled as to why they're hanging out together. Momo looks irritated, while Daiki's face is just stupid. They definitely don't seem like they know each other. Wakaba decides to meddle in and save the day. She pauses for a moment to ponder which version of herself to unleash. The wild and wacky tomboy or the sweet and innocent college girl. With a mischievous grin, she waves at her friends. Momo instantly responds to her and walks towards her and apologizes for suddenly showing up. Meanwhile, Daiki, who's been observing from afar, finally figures out that she's one of Wakaba's friends. Wakaba, with a fit of coughing, manages to thank her for coming. Momo lets her know that there's a test on Monday, so she came to give her the printout. She's quite worried about Wakaba's cough and raspy voice. Wakaba reassures her not to be concerned and questions why Daiki is present. Little did they know she was using fake coughs to disguise her tomboyish style that she usually uses with Daiki. He passes her the packet, and she graciously accepts it, thanking him. Momo ponders if Wakaba is friends with the boy. Concerned about her coughing, he promptly offers to leave so she can rest. Momo bids her farewell as well. Wakaba expresses gratitude to both of them but coughs once more before leaving. Once Wakaba is out of sight, Momo bows and apologizes to Daiki. He kindly accepts her apologies and strolls towards his apartment. He swings open the door and steps into his room. As he adjusts his glasses, he can't help but feel a bit embarrassed about the awkward encounter with that girl. Being treated like a creep is no joke, and to top it off, he's today's unluckiest zodiac sign, Cancer. On the other side, Wakaba eagerly unwraps the package given to her by Daiki, curious to see what's inside, and it is a pleasant surprise for her to see peach jelly which is her absolute favorite. With a smile, she takes a bite and savors the delicious taste. That is the perk of being a Leo, the luckiest sign of the day. Wakaba and Daiki are walking back home together, just like they always do. The only difference this time is that Wakaba is complaining about the rain. Daiki casually points out that it's called the rainy season for a reason. She feels freaked out that they won't be able to play soccer now. Daiki asks her if she plans to go straight home. Wakaba knows nothing is exciting waiting for her at home, so she suggests taking a little detour. Daiki tells her to wait, but we all know Wakaba never listens to anyone. Eventually, they end up in a park that Wakaba recognizes. She mentions there used to be a penny candy shop around here. Then she playfully reminds Daiki about the time when he peed in his pants on the way home from kindergarten. He immediately feels embarrassed and urges her to just forget about that embarrassing moment already. As he looks at her, he realizes that she has never been the type to stay indoors on rainy days, and she seems to have made new friends too. Lately he's noticed that she's been wearing different clothes, but despite all these changes, some things never seem to change. Excitedly she calls out to him and points towards something, saying that there are snails on the grass. However, Daiki starts sweating as he notices something else, Wakaba's wet clothes that are revealing her underclothes. Things are definitely getting a little tricky back here. He's amazed that she hasn't noticed yet, and he's thinking whether or not he should speak up. Is this one of those things that guys should just keep quiet about? In his anxious state, he adjusts his glasses, and poor guy, he's still sweating even though it's raining. He believes that she's not the kind of person who would care about it anyway and he can already predict her response. She'd probably say, wow, it's just a bra, and then tease him, asking if he's the saint of pervs or something, or maybe she has transformed into a charming girl, and he's simply unaware of it. He chooses to play dumb, acting as if he didn't witness anything, and suggests they should head straight home. However, his worry intensifies as he contemplates the possibility of encountering someone else on their way back. What if they notice her drenched appearance and give her a second glance? That would be quite bad. He approaches her with gentle steps, softly calling out her name. She turns around and gazes at him. He hands her his jersey and he suddenly tells her that her clothes are soaked and she will catch a cold if she stays like this. He explains to her that he has only worn this sweater just once, so she can take it. Upon hearing this Wakaba's eyes glitter and she looks at him. She notices she is soaked which she hadn't noticed before, pondering that she has a top tank underneath so it doesn't really matter. Still, she decides to take his sweater. 
as she has always wanted some of his clothes, she moves her hand and gestures for him to hand it over. With a smug look on her face, she casually asks if the sweater is really sweat-free. He quickly assures her that he's only worn it once, assuming she's still the same old Wakaba. Finally, they arrive at their apartments. Wakaba sits down on her bed, trying to dry her completely drenched hair. She prays that the bath water heats up quickly because she's in desperate need of a warm soak. She mustn't forget to wash Daiki's jersey too. As she takes a glance at the jersey hanging on the wall, she can't help but smile mischievously. She can't resist the temptation as she gazes at it. Putting on the jersey once more, she exclaims that she had this thought before, but it's even more impressive now. It truly feels like it belongs to a man. She blushes, wondering how he can be so big. With a shy giggle, she hides her face behind her hands. However, she notices that it doesn't have much of a scent. Rolling onto her bed, she buries her face in it, contemplating if she's just being a silly pervert. Her face is beaming with joy as she bursts into laughter once again. The next day, Daiki knocks on her door. As she opens it, she notices his half-closed eyes and jokingly remarks that he looks like a zombie. She playfully asks if he stayed up all night gaming once more. Poor Daiki blushes and sweats, remembering that he actually spent the entire night daydreaming about her drenched clothes. Oblivious to his inner turmoil, she hands him his jersey and expresses her gratitude. He grabs the jersey and a delightful floral scent tickles his nose. He's amazed that it carries Wakaba's fragrance, making it even more special. His heart starts racing like a clock ticking, and he wonders if he's being a bit too pervy for getting tempted by just a scent. Out of the blue, Wakaba's dad appears and she warmly greets him. Daiki can't help but feel a bit nervous, but he manages to bow and greet him back with a smile. Her dad reminds them to watch out on their way to school. Wakaba also says goodbye to him. Daiki's mouth drops open in astonishment as he realizes that her dad smells just like Wakaba. She tells him to get going. Meanwhile, Daiki stands there frozen like a statue. Poor boy, he didn't realize that it was their fabric softener. Now we get to see Daiki with his friends. He and Matson are walking along when Matson eagerly calls Fuji and suggests grabbing some okonomiyaki on their way home. He politely declines, explaining that he wants to be present when his favorite Oshi reaches 8M subscribers. Daiki tries to remember it if they're talking about something virtual, but he can't recall the full name. Fuji informs him that it's Riri from the Virtual Siren. He emphasizes that he needs to save money for her and can't afford to spend it on eating with them. They both spur up their faces and exclaim with so much emotion that they can't even imagine what he just said. They label him as a lousy friend who deeply hurt them with those words. Fuji immediately spins around and firmly tells them to go away. As he heads home, his tummy grumbles and poor Fuji can't help but think that their discussion about food has made him hungry. He ponders if they're currently devouring some delicious okonomiyaki. Perhaps he can grab a little something from the nearby convenience store. Then he denies himself thinking he must ignore this necessary item. After all, he can't afford to spend even a single yen for Riri's sake. Out of the blue, he hears a loud scream with someone complaining about the high price of 50 yen. He spots a Kuzunoki high school girl vigorously shaking her head, leaving the item on the counter, and sarcastically remarking how she's supposed to purchase it now with such a high price. He quietly strolls past her, not wanting to get involved with her. He thinks that if a girl from a co-ed school hangs out with an introvert the contrast is just too much. He decides to stay out of it because no one can top his Riri, who graduated from an all-girls school, and loves Yuri. Suddenly he hears the girl calling him from behind. He's shocked and turns around to see her looking at her like he's lost his mind. She asks him in a desperate tone if he has 100 yen because she could have sworn it was in her wallet. Now she can't even buy a drink for just 50 yen. She pleads with him to lend her 100 yen. He is taken aback and looks at himself in disbelief as if questioning whether she's actually talking to him. He's completely stunned and wonders why she's approaching him when they're complete strangers. The girl keeps pleading with him, promising to repay him if he helps her. She even claims that she'll die if she doesn't get something to drink. Fuji can't help but imagine himself saying, No way, that money is meant for Riri, and he won't even hesitate to spend a dime, sending a thousand deaths her way. But can you blame a single guy who finally gets to talk to a real girl? Of course not. So as expected, he hands over the cash to our girl, Akko. She walks off with a gorgeous smile, 
waving at him and promising to pay him back next time. As she disappears from his view, he grabs his hair in disbelief and anxiously ponders whether he made a mistake by giving it to her, considering she's the type of girl who loves teasing introverts. He starts questioning if he got played. He prays that nobody witnessed that embarrassing moment, fearing that he'll be dead if anyone discovers he got hustled by a girl. The following day, this dude boasts around his buddies, narrating the entire incident. He brags about how he couldn't care less and how he planned to brush her off anyway. But then he realized she was incredibly desperate, and it was only 100 yen, even though it's not his usual style and all that jazz. Matson tickles Daiki and asks if he is hearing this dude who rejected Okonomiyaki just to impress a girl. Daiki calls him a backstabber for fooling their friend. Fuji doesn't care about their opinions. Matson adds a bit more questioning the logic of giving money to a girl who won't even let him get close. Fuji gets all worked up and snaps back, claiming he was just trying to cheer her up, but how could someone as clueless as Matson understand that? They notice a commotion at the entrance, with boys excitedly gossiping about some adorable girl. It seems like there's something big happening there, but what could it possibly be? Fuji heads over to the entrance with his buddies, and his jaw drops when he sees the same girl from yesterday. He's curious about why she's here and wonders if she is really serious about giving the money back. It's impressive but she also brought along a group of friends. Wakaba is among them too, and she sneaks behind the door when she sees Daiki in front of them. Fuji is taken aback and realizes there's absolutely no chance he can approach a group of girls like that. Her friends inquire if he's the guy who gave her a hundred yen, noting how comfortable he seems at Swamp High. Fuji is sweating as he ponders about approaching them thinking it would be a nightmare. However, with the three of them around, it might not be so bad. Matt's son is great at keeping everyone entertained, so it should all go smoothly. He glances back and grinds, calling out to Matt's son who seems lost in his own thoughts. Poor dude is totally freaked out when he spots Akko over there. She's the friend of Daiki's friend who has rejected him in so many ways that he finally decided to be happy with just friends and gave up on getting a girl. He quickly dashes back and says that he totally forgot about something he had to do, so he needs to head back to the classroom. Fuji is surprised by his sudden behavior and asks Daiki what's up with him. Daiki can't help but notice a group of girls, and guess who he sees? None other than Momo with that unforgettable angry face. She had warned him before about creeping her out and even threatened to call the police. Poor Daiki, he's totally traumatized by the sight of her. Without wasting a second, he quickly tells Fuji that he's got some urgent business and needs to leave through the back gate. Poor Fuji is left utterly bewildered by his friend's sudden betrayal. He yells after him, begging him to wait. He admits to Daiki that he lied to them and that she actually tricked him. With a sweaty face, he pleads for him to return because he needs him. Right at that moment, Akka walks towards him and calls him. She repays him and expresses gratitude for lending her 100 yen and as a token of appreciation, she offers him one of those delicious snacks. In return, a bewildered Fuji can only show a silly laugh. Here I am, know it's been a while, I was in denial about my life. Here I stand, 